Thank you very much for that, guys. I, uh, my boss has been emailing me this week saying, Dave, it doesn't look like you're doing any work in all the photos you're posting on Facebook. So I thought I'd take a selfie and send that to him. So maybe now he thinks I'm doing some work whilst I'm out here and not just drinking and eating barbecue. Um, so yeah, my name's David Nye. I am the product, ma uh, the product analytics manager and experimentation manager at Hotels.com. Um, you guys book Hotels.com? I'm hoping it'd be louder than that, but I'll take it. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm going to be talking to you today a little bit about our test and learn program. Uh, we've been testing at Hotels.com since 2008, so I'll talk a bit about what our program looked like then, uh, how we got investment into our test and learn program, how since then it's changed, the things we've done, how we sold it to the senior leadership in the business, how we could get more investment, more resource to scale it up. Um, and yeah, and kind of talk about some of the things we learned along the way, some of the challenges we have, and how we've managed them, and how we've kind of approached those things. So the first thing I'd say about where our program's at today is we're very much test first. Every single feature on the site, we do test it. Um, we're running uh, tests in over 80 countries worldwide now, which is essentially every single country that Hotels.com operates in. Um, and we're running tests across desktop, tablet, and mobile web. And crucially, our iOS and Android app. So essentially, every single customer that hits our website will be tested on. We're running more than 500 tests a year now. And that's a number that's scaled up every single year since we started testing back in 2008. And this is something I'm, I'm really proud of that I really like. Every single test that we run, we capture over 90 columns or 90 elements of data on each test. We keep all this test, test data in a central repository that allows us to analyze all of our tests at a macro level, so how the whole program is doing and how it's being. And then the last thing, uh, something that our analysts really like, is we have an automated test readout dashboard that we've custom built for all of our tests. So when we're trying to make decisions on if a test has been successful or not, it's not a question of running lots of queries and going into the back end of data. It's about surfacing insights quickly so they can be actioned quickly. So um, to go back to 2008, this is what testing looked like at Hotels.com. And on the face of it, it wasn't that bad a process. Um, we had an idea that someone would have. Then uh, the test, that test idea would then go and get built. We'd then test it. Fantastic. We'd analyze it. Finalize, job done. We finished that test. It's over. It's finished. Now, on the face of it, it sounds great, but we started running into problems very, very quickly. The first of which is, funnily enough, a lot of the test ideas tended to come from the hippos in the business, which uh, is obviously not surprising. After that, uh, we had a lot of problems where we'd build a test, and then we'd launch it, and then we'd see there's a problem with it. And then after that test had a problem, it would break. Maybe the reporting would break. We would have situations where users were bleeding into our, our control and test groups, so kind of reassignment, which was really problematic for us. Um, as well as this, our testing tool at the time ran on a release process that took six weeks. So if you identified a bug today, that is not getting fixed for six weeks and getting back onto the site. So really problematic for us and really difficult to help maintain test velocity. Uh, in, terms of the analysis, uh, in terms of the analysis, so we were maybe at this point testing 20% of features on our site, and there was one analyst, which was me. Uh, so I had piles and piles of work to get through, which was just not feasible. And the tool set I had was, was pretty bad. Um, we, uh, all of the data that I was getting hold of, I was kind of running queries and working all the time trying to get, get somewhere, and I had no kind of automated way of, of going through test results and analyzing them. And then this final step, finalize the test results done. Didn't take any learnings, didn't take any further. So we might have a great idea. Have we mined that to its fullest potential? Not so sure. So I felt a bit like this guy. Um, I had short hair then. And, uh, and yeah, you know, we knew that we had to change things. Um, we knew we had myself as a dedicated analyst and hundreds of developers building features on the site. We weren't testing enough on all the features. We were picking features to test based off whoever shouted the loudest as opposed to testing everything, which we should do. Um, and the analysis was really, really hard work. And we had one testing tool that was antiquated and didn't really work for us. So what we needed to do was get um, investment into the test and learn program from the senior leadership level. So I kind of went to the senior leaders at Hotels.com. Um, and I built a case so we could get that investment. We could get more people to buy into it and make testing more central to our business. And so the first thing that I made as a case was managing risk. If you are not testing everything that you roll onto your website, you do not know if it's help helping or hurting the website. So having this view of managing risk of every single feature we launch 
was really liked by the senior leadership team, and that was the first point we took. After that, we had a return on investment. Occasionally, to build out features for Hotels.com, we're investing in whole new teams of developers. So being able to see, OK, these developers have built this new feature. Let's test it in. What's the impact? How's, what's that doing to conversion, gross profit per visitor, et cetera, was a great metric to have and also kind of helps drive the case for a, for a test and learn program. And then competition. So we're in a situation now in a kind of culture we fostered where we have different product teams across the site who will look after, say, our home page as one team and our shopping pages as another. And they kind of compete against each other to get that big test win. And that's something we wanted to foster within our test and learn program. And then prioritization. So in terms of building out our, our product, um, building out new features on hotels.com on our apps, et cetera, having a test and learn program helps you kind of decide what to build, what to build next, drive that roadmap forward. Otherwise, it's all opinions. So that's what we wanted to feed into the test and learn program. And finally, knowledge building. A lot of our uh, designers in the business, a lot of our product managers, a lot of just the whole, the business as a whole, didn't really know enough about how our customers use the site. Through test analysis, we wanted to surface new insights to help make everyone aware of how the, the, our customers use the site and in turn build features to solve their problems. So then uh, I kind of put this case together. I sent it off to um, our senior leadership team, presented it to them, asked for investment, and luckily we did get investment. So uh, they, they backed us and they kind of said, OK, great, go off. You can go and uh, invest in your test and learn program and build, build and get resource for that. So, the way that we did it is it wasn't as simple as just getting um, a new tool in place. We really had to scale ourselves up in people, process, and tools. So I'll go through a bit about what we did there. So on the people side, um, we knew we had a problem with no capacity to analyze our site features and everything we wanted to launch. We had no one who could launch and turn off tests, no one dedicated to that. Um, and we had nothing in line of our product tech teams as they scaled. So as I said earlier, we had loads of developers coming in, and there was me as the one analyst as time went by. In terms of process, uh, there was no awareness across the business of test results in the test program. So often, uh, tests would get ran. Everyone else in the business would be unaware of it, apart from that one team who was involved with that specific feature. On top of this, there was no key decision makers behind when tests were ran. So sometimes a test would finish, and there'd be an awkward back and forth around where to go next. Um, and we had no way of understanding the true value of our test and learn program as a whole. So it was difficult to understand how much to invest into it. So these were, these were problems we need to fix. And finally, on the tooling side, um, our testing tool, I say it was release-based and very slow to use, but as well as our testing tool, we had problems in managing process. So we need new, some kind of new process management tool. We need new analytics tools as well. Lots of areas that we need to invest in, not just that test tool side. So, the first area that we looked at was people and how we could get everyone involved. I think testing can quite often be a siloed process. You would have a product manager who would build out a test, review that test, potentially analyze it themselves, and that's it, job done. And the rest of the business isn't really taken along for the ride. Um, this was even more the case when we started ramping up velocity and we're running, kind of launching 10 tests a week, calling 10 tests a week. But a lot of the people in the business didn't really know enough about the test and learn program, what was happening. So what we did here is we started having big forums, all hands, so everyone in the business knows what's happening with testing. We have uh, these test-a-thon days where we get everyone in the business to submit test ideas and we build them. Um, we really tried to get everyone involved. We wanted everyone in the business to be part of the test and learn program and ultimately the way I wanted testing to be and how I think it is now at hotels is if anyone in the business has an idea and they want to see it to fruition and see that impact, they have to test it in and that's how they demonstrate the value of what they want to do. So that was the, the first change we made. This second change is very much around your structure and, and where, we, where we set our analytics team. Um, on the left hand side, we kind of have this self-service analytics, which is where perhaps a product manager building out a feature would also be the same person who is responsible to analyze their test, which is an approach you can take. But my opinion very much there is that if I was building a feature and then I was analyzing that feature, it kind of makes me think if I was going to school and then marking my homework, maybe I'll give myself a better grade. So we, we, we kind of, I think that's a very solid way to approach it. But um, often I think it's, it's, you don't always get the right insights and perhaps you're a bit biased in your analysis. 
This other side is very much around um, a managed service where you have a separate analytics team that analyze your tests and work that way. Um, this is good, but then perhaps you're not as close to the original product or idea that you're launching on the site. So there's definitely pros and cons of each. And within Expedia brands, um, we actually manage this differently. Hotels.com act differently to Expedia do here. So I think there's pros and cons for each way. The way that we manage it is we have a separate analytics team, but they're kind of paired off and working with our product functions, and it kind of works for us. I don't really want to just go through Bain's rapid framework, um, but what I do want to say is that having an owner for every single process uh, as part of the test and learn program from turning on and off a test to making a decision is absolutely crucial. Uh, if, if for any reason that we don't have an owner for any one of those steps, it's something that slows down tests, slows down velocity. We've had situations before where perhaps a test is finished and it was positive, but maybe it's someone's opinion that it might be impacting a secondary metric on the page. So it slows down the launch, slows things down, which is why we have assigned owners to every single step of the process at Hotels.com. And then uh, measuring the value of the test and learn program. So once we got it built, we didn't just want to leave it there. We wanted to continually uh, measure the value of how much testing's worth to us. So we wanted to collect data from our tests at a macro level. So the first thing we started doing is saving all of our tests and results, logging them, where I mentioned we have kind of 90 points of data against each test. Then we started monitoring the underlying conversion of the site and app over time to ensure that what we're doing is working and helping across our different platforms. And then after that, we tag tests from themes or conversion veins. So what I mean here is we look at a bunch of nudge concepts, we look at a bunch of segments of our users, and we see where are our tests working, have we fully mind those, those areas of working stuff like social proof in the last presentation. When we get those kind of wins, have we used that across the site? Have we tested it everywhere? Have we shared that learning with the entire team? And then finally, report and drive the program. Every quarter now, we report um, the success of the test and learn program to the entire business in terms of how all our tests are doing, the biggest wins, biggest losses, the segments that do really well. So then we can inform our product roadmap in terms of what we build next and how we keep going. So this, is, uh, this has been really beneficial and has helped kind of drive more and more investment into our test and learn program over the last eight, nine years. Um, and then in terms of tools and how we, how we built out our tools. So uh, the first thing on the tooling side very much is pipelining and process management, which perhaps isn't the most exciting thing to talk about, but very, very necessary in testing. Um, we have JIRA now set up so that we manage every single stage of a test from when it's uh, built out initially, uh, when it's going through build of our tech teams, when it goes to the QA process, we have our analytics team check it so it's reporting correctly, we have um, our, the initial person who came up with the test idea to check it so it matches their vision when it was first built out. And then obviously it goes through to the test being live, to completed, and then eventually in the code base. So all of this stuff that can create a lot of confusion is all managed in a pipeline manner within JIRA and different JIRA statuses that helps us a lot. Of course, we had an upgrade to our testing tools, uh, as well as our in-house tool, which we, we've upgraded since 2008, obviously. But we also um, started working with SiteSpec and Aptimize. SiteSpec's for our desktop, tablet, and mobile web testing, and Aptimize for our apps, for the iOS and Android apps. The really cool thing about SiteSpec specifically, it's been really easy for people to build tests, so it's a great way to kind of get people not involved in the test and learn program, get your organization involved, and get them to build their own tests, because a, a lot of simpler copy tests can be built easily there. And then finally, uh, the reporting tools and sets. Um, we have an entire pod of developers dedicated to managing our backend database in terms of how we, our data marks for testing. As well as that, we've invested in Adobe Analytics so that we can do ad hoc deep dives. Uh, we use AWS uh, to get a lot of data from the cloud in terms of how our site's performing. And we've built some scripts in Python, like automated notebooks, to handle analysis for the teams. So that's kind of an area that we've really invested a lot of time in that helps making analyzed tests a lot quicker. So back to the initial linear process that we had. Um, uh, this is kind of where we were back in 2008. And now, coming to where we are in 2017, we've kind of tried to have this more cyclical process where we're making observations, be it a, a user research session, um, be it in previous tests, or just exploratory uh, analytics into the data sets we have at hotels. Or my mum sometimes chips in with the odd idea. Uh, investigating 
um, investigating that, kind of finding the insights, seeing how feasible it is to launch a test. We don't just take the idea and go of it live. We think, what's the feasibility? How big is it? How big is the opportunity? Driving those insights, kind of hypotheses off the back of that. So, OK, what do we, what do, we do here? You know, what's the test? What do we actually want to test? Experimenting, concluding, and keep going around that cycle to continually optimize the site. So that's kind of where, where we are today at hotels. Uh, what I would say is that even over the last kind of seven, eight years, we've, we've made a lot of steps that I think are really good, and I'm proud of where our test and learn program is. Definitely, there's a lot of things that we're still improving, and here's a couple of the learnings that we're taking and kind of working on, I suppose, over time. So often, I kind of feel like this guy on the left, um, where we have a lot of stakeholders who perhaps they have their one test a year. We have 500 tests that we're running, and they have one test a year. So every day, they're at my desk chasing it, chasing the members of my team. And they want to know, you know, when can I call that test? When can we review it? What's the impact? And what I'd always say is, is some advice here is always stick to statistics and fight off your stakeholders where possible. Um, you know, put rules and regulations in place around how you call tests and stick to those things. Otherwise, you're simply not testing. Um, the only scenario in which we would turn off a test early is if we're losing a significant amount of money, because quite simply, we're a business at the end of the day. But otherwise, we would always stick to that process, and we would always call tests uh, when we deem we would do so. The next part is about test velocity. And I really believe that upping your test velocity is a crucial element of any successful test and learn program. However, you know, I'm paid to uh, run tests that make money, not just run a bunch of tests. So, we very much track our test velocity, and we, we use that as a measure of success to an extent in terms of how our teams, teams are working, how they're operating. But we also do t-shirt sizing on those tests. We look at the size of impact. We monitor the size of the average win, the win rate as well. And they're much more important metrics to us, as well as, of course, the underlying conversion of the site. We need to make sure that's still growing. So test velocity is good, but you don't want to foster a culture whereby you're just building smaller and smaller tests that don't drive those wins you need. Uh, the next tip I would call out is around optimizing the optimization program itself. So uh, everyone on my team, we dedicate a day a week not to test analysis, not to test analytics, purely just to working on our tools. How can we document? How can we automate anything? We don't want to have any kind of monotony in the test and learn process. We want to often a weird custom piece of analytics that's asked for by um, anyone in, in the wider team, in our product teams. Often it gets asked for again. So we have a code repository where we keep all of our code um, on the site. And then uh, a, lo a lot of our analysts use that stuff again and again and again. So one day a week, just optimizing the optimization program. Retesting is something I think is really interesting. Um, I would always like to retest where possible, but it's often not uh, an option because of a product roadmap. You've got to keep driving the product forward. However. Um, I would say that there's kind of two scenarios where I do really advocate for retesting. One is, what's the risk of the feature you're putting onto the site? Is it high risk? Is it a big change? Do you believe the initial set of results? Retest, always there. It's something we always try and do based off risk. The second is, what's the kind of life cycle of your site? Is it uh, three months, six months, nine months? How quick are things changing? How, far, how long does it take for a result to expire? And in my opinion, a retest is never identical as the previous test we had on the site, and I'd always encourage us to do it. And we do often do lots of retests with minor variations and changes because of the pace at which our site is changing. Something um, on the next side, so something that kind of keeps me up at night that's, uh, that's pretty problematic for us is data quality. Um, we, over the years, we've had a lot of problems where our tests have failed, and we've had reporting drop off, or we've had reassignment between groups, um, and they've gone unnoticed. So one thing that we've really started upping our investment into is data quality, automated flagging of when a test is failing, um, kind of any kind of data issue, of which we've identified plenty over the years of a test failing, assignments being unequal, this reassignment thing, or just a test stop reporting, that kind of thing. That's all fed directly into our, auto, into our dashboards around testing that we use for every single test, and it saves so much time. One thing we actually track every quarter is how many days we lost this quarter because of test failing and data problems. And that's something we're always trying to shrink and cut down and make sure that our test abandonment rate is low because that's wasted time. The final thing I would say 
is definitely test everything within reason, but the three questions I always ask everyone in our business when they have a test idea is, why am I doing this test? What's the measure for success? And if it wins, can I feasibly roll it out? Is it something we can actually do? So that's it from me. Um, the only thing I'd say is we're definitely hiring, so please do visit lifeatexpedia.com if you're looking to move into the travel market. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, do we have any questions? We have a ton of questions. This oh, is wow. by far the session that had the most questions. <laughs> so uh, we're probably not going to do all of them, but let's let's yeah, let's get through as many as we can. First one: How do you document or, or document organize the results and the result and learning of a large volume of tests? How do you share that? With great difficulty. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, well, the first thing we do is we have, a, we have a centralized table within AWS where we document all of the test results. So every test result runs through kind of like a standard um, set of calculations that we've automated in Python that d document them all and scale them up to a certain level. We can compare the tests against each other. We also have a connection to our JIRA data, which has all of these tags against tests. So that we have all that data as well. We pull all of that, and then we're putting it in kind of a central repository. Um, we have a PowerPoint we generate for each deck as well that we're adding, uploading to that central repository. And then we have kind of mo weekly, monthly meetings where we're pulling that stuff together and presenting it to the business. So that's kind of how we do it, but we're always trying to kind of optimize there because there are too many manual elements that we're trying to take out of the team and automate what we can. If you've got different teams testing different pages, how do you make sure one test isn't skewed by another? That is an excellent question and something that, that concerns me a lot. So. Uh, I think we try and handle this by both process and tools. So on the process side, um, we have meetings with, the, with each of these separate testing teams on a weekly basis around what tests you're launching, what's live. Do we hypothesize any of these things or interact with each other? On the tooling side, which we're pretty nascent in, but we're certainly working on developing, is, OK, if I was to assume a two-test world, I want to compare all of the tests I have on the site and compare them against each other, see if they're interacting. So we're taking all of this test data we have, comparing all of our different tests, which is an automated process we're running every week, which kind of pulls out interaction effects between tests for us. So it works, but it's not great, because of course, if you have, say, three tests interacting, we won't see it. But th those kind of two-sided process of do we hypothesize anything interacts, and then is anything picked up by our tool that we've built, that's kind of how we identify and how we work through that stuff. How do you deal with the politics and agenda pushers? <laughs> in big organizations, this is a big hindrance to having an effective testing program. I mean, there's no politics and agenda pushers at Hotels.com, so that's how we do it. No, um, so uh, we, um, if I'm honest, I, that's kind of partly true. We have a really, uh, really solid test and learn program that I think everyone backs. Um, it's something we've scattered. We've, kind of scaled up over so many years now that it's kind of core to how we release features. Like, one thing around, I suppose, when perhaps someone doesn't agree so much with the test and learn program, it's a standardized process. Everyone goes through the same thing. It's standardized calculations against tests. If their feature doesn't work. It doesn't go onto the site. So as much as we might have people pushing an agenda, they still have to test their feature against everyone else's. So it kind of, we kind of just manage it through the data, essentially. Uh, what's your process for, boom. Why did you choose <laughs> Adobe Analytics over Google Analytics? Adobe versus Google, let's hear it. Yeah, I mean, uh, that is a decision that happened before my time, but there's a few things there I'm happy to talk about offline. Um, there's a, there, there's, you know, there, we, we use Adobe Analytics, but crucially, one thing I didn't really mention is we, we log a lot of data ourselves, and that's a lot of the data that we're currently loading up into AWS. Um, and we perhaps use that a bit more than, than Adobe Analytics in some scenarios. Um, yeah, uh, we, use G we have an implementation of GA as well, but our test and learn programs off the back of Adobe Analytics. It's not saying it's something we wouldn't ever review. Uh, what? <laughs> Sorry, there's loads of questions. Wow. <laughs> What's your process for tech? I'm not laughing at the question. It's just because they keep bumping up that I get confused. Uh, was it a conscious decision for you to refer to it as a test and learn program? <laughs> Now you're just messing with me, uh, <laughs> multitasking. I don't know, I think <laughs> so, it sounds yeah, nice. Um, well, I mean, we refer to it as both, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, 
I know that I said program 27 times in my presentation because I used the British spelling and then had to change it before today. So <laughs> perhaps said it a few too many times, but um, I, both, we refer to it as both. I don't think that was part of like the, the sell to our senior leadership team, if I'm honest. Now we've got to say this fast before it changes. Uh, what process for tagging tests? How many tags do you recommend using to filter tests? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, well, I think that's entirely dependent down to your own organization and what you're testing. Um, for us, we kind of have uh, five or six meta tags we use, but it really depends on what the strategy is at the time um, and what, what you're focusing on. So we do a lot of things right now. We have a lot of focus on different platforms, and so we do a lot of tags around that. Um, but it really depends on what the focus is at the time of the business. I don't think it's something that I would, we would ever limit as such. It's something we'd always be additive to. Uh, yep, we're going to do one more. Cool. Uh, <laughs> well, there was one really good one, but it disappeared now. Uh, it was really, really relevant. But anyways. They're all good questions as well. Don't yeah, put yeah, them yeah. down. Sorry. That's okay. Confirmation bias. <laughs> uh, what does a company testathon look like? Um, uh, so, a company testathon is where we will have maybe 20 or 30 people from our product analytics uh, and tech teams go to our offices where we'll kind of sit together in a room for two days, uh, order a lot of pizza. Uh, we have a big idea generation session from everyone around the business. Um, we get lots and lots of test ideas. We then go ahead and build out all of those test ideas, or as many as we can over two days. And we normally do it themed, so we try and make it a bit more fun. So like the last one we ran was Test of Thrones, um, which was pretty good. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's just a bit of fun for us to work with our developers who are based in a different country, and also it it's really helps with our test velocity of building lots of tests. And it's the kind of scenario where anyone can come and join if they want to and use tools like SiteSpec to build these, build these uh, different tests and change stuff on the site. So, yeah. Awesome. Let's cut it here and just say thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Cheers.